We are doing show number 60. On tonight's show, this is an abduction researcher, author and lecturer with 23 years experience in the field, MUFON's Researcher of the Year Award winning International Director of Abduction Research. She has a BA in Social Work with Honours from the Uni of New Hampshire in 1971, also a certified hypnotherapist, co-author of Captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, Science Was Wrong, with co-author Stanton Freeman. I believe he did two chapters in that. We uh, each did seven. Really? Awesome. Yes. And the Alien Abduction Files with Denise Stoner, and there's a lot more bio to read. We have Kathleen Martin. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be with you tonight. You're in spring at the moment, going towards summer. I can only imagine it would be beautiful. Yes, we are, and it is so beautiful here in Florida. The weather is just perfect most of the time. We live on the east coast of Australia, Mm -hmm. and sunrises are amazing, and it's always a different scene. Mm -hmm. My my father was a, a sailor, and he kept telling me that rhyme to do with what color it is at night in the daytime, and I always get confused. <laughs> That's a rhyme that I learned when I was in the second grade. About yeah. uh, yes, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. That's is what we learned here. Huh. I think it's a sailor's tale from around the world, and I, it looks yes. like there must be some credence in it. I'll tell you that. Yes. I have to say, I'm a big fan of, and um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I ask this of all of our guests, and everyone tells a tale of, you know, they were doing something else, and then suddenly a 90-degree turn occurred in their career path. Did you expect to be where you are now, if you look back? And what was it that triggered your turn into the UFO phenomenon? Well, I have to say that I had never planned on becoming a professional ufologist. Uh, I went to college. I uh, followed a typical career. I started out in social work. Uh, My primary interest was in social research, uh, but I found that I had to support myself and uh, a husband who was studying for his doctorate. And so back in those days, it was most important for the man to finish and and get on his feet before the woman did. Uh, so I ended up uh, actually getting divorced when the time came for me to go to graduate school. I had a full scholarship to study toward a doctorate in school psychology, but ended up only doing graduate work uh, while I supported myself as uh, a teacher at that point, and I later became an education services coordinator um, had uh, a typical life, um, married, had uh, two children, and uh, then uh, three stepchildren came along as well. And it wasn't until 1990 I decided to investigate my aunt and uncle's UFO abduction in earnest. Uh, at that time, I had left my position as an educator And I had five children at home, actually, two sons and three stepsons. And I was looking for some intellectual stimulation. I had always wanted to investigate my aunt and uncle's UFO abduction. I had been hearing some very negative comments and reading negative comments in the media on television And they didn't have the ring of truth. I wanted to separate fact from fiction. So I lived fairly close to my Aunt Betty Hill. And I asked her if she'd be willing to cooperate with me in my investigation of her case. And she agreed to. And over the next 14 years, I played devil's advocate as I interviewed Betty as I tape recorded her statements regarding exactly what happened to her. 
In the course of that 14 years, she turned over 40 years of investigative files to me. The original investigation reports, letters to and from scientists, uh, the Project Blue Book report from Pease Air Force Base that indicated that there was a radar sighting on the night of September 20th, this is 19th to 20th, the early morning hours of September 20th uh, at Pease Air Force Base of an unidentified object in the sky. Uh, this was very interesting. It had been debunked as being nothing. But then I discovered, as I continued with my research, that there was also a sighting that night on radar in Vermont at the air station there. Uh, I became more and more convinced as time went on that something had actually occurred. And then Betty turned her hypnosis tapes over to me, the tapes that she had uh, recorded and my Uncle Barney had recorded separately with a renowned psychiatrist from Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Benjamin Simon. And Dr. Simon uh, was outstanding in his field for his work during World War II with victims of what we then called conversion hysteria and shell shock. We call it today post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, also it is uh, results in the phys physical disability that is psychologically generated. In other words, uh, a soldier might suffer blindness after watching his buddy's head being blown off, mm -hmm. and there's no physiological reason for that blindness. Right. Dr. Simon had a tremendous amount of success in treating this disorder. He saw Betty and Barney separately for a period of six months and imposed amnesia. And in, on those tapes that I transcribed, I discovered that Betty and Barney made set statements. They made these statements separately. In, amnesia had been imposed. There was no way that they could have uh, known what the other was saying. They paid a great deal of money and traveled over an hour each way every Saturday for six months to see this doctor. Mm. They were not creating a hoax. In fact, they were committed to the idea that this information would never be made public. They, what I found was that Betty's and Barney's story meshed completely and was somewhat different than a series of dreams that Betty had had starting 10 nights after their UFO close encounter in New Hampshire's White Mountains. The evidence became clearer and clearer that this was a real event, and I wanted to write not only Betty's biography, but also my case study of this. There was only one piece of evidence that... I did not want to take the time to investigate. And Stanton T. Friedman, nuclear physicist and well-known UFO researcher, had had involvement in that piece of work. He was the first to publish on Marjorie Fish's work. She was a brilliant woman from Ohio, and she had studied the star map that Betty Hill had drawn uh, as a result of a post-hypnotic suggestion by Dr. Simon. Madri's work was accurate. It was vetted by a number of scientists, and Stan had been defending Madri's work for many, many years. I asked Stan to write about the star map. So of 24 chapters in the book, Stan wrote two chapters, and uh, I greatly appreciated his assistance in helping me with this book. 
his name went first on the book, and that's been confusing to many people. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, it is because our, the publisher insisted that it would sell better. It would sell more books. And, and you know, they're, they wanted to make money. They're a business. And so that's the reason that Stan's name went first. Uh, from day one, he has always stated that I was the primary author in that. And after I completed that book, Stan and I worked together on a second book, Science Was Wrong, in which each of us wrote seven chapters. And then I went on to conduct more and more research. I had always been researching since 1990, abductions in general, but started to work with abduction experiencers from around the world. And uh, just finished writing The Alien Abduction Files uh, with Denise Stoner. So uh, that's where I am at this point in time. Oh, wow. It's, you know, I've been writing questions down as you've been going there. And um, uh, the uh, something that always concerned me with uh, hypnosis was that they um, be extremely careful to not lead the witness through their journey. Um, so it's a, not a trip of imagination. It's, it's really opening up the closed doors and revealing what's there. Um, it, but in Barney Hills, um, uh, the person that they saw, uh, the professional they saw, it, it, there, when you listen to the tapes, could you hear anything like that in there? He uh, did suggest to them that this couldn't have happened, that it was impossible. He attempted wow. to lead them away from the story that each of them was telling separately, and that story was the same. He had almost no knowledge about UFOs. Uh, This was the first case actually reported in the United States, and uh, he said that he believed in their honesty, but that this story was fantastic. And, you know, so he thought that perhaps... Barney was listening to Betty's dream material, which he denied, actually, over and over again. Mm -hmm. He said he heard very, very little of that. Um, But Dr. Simon couldn't think of another hypothesis that could possibly explain this. Barney and Betty were, were sane, stable, productive members of their community and, uh, you know, members of their church honest people, of good reputation. How else could he explain it? Uh, And what I discovered is that that explanation is not viable. Yeah, yeah. When I was um, uh, myself, I've been down the same road. And uh, that's why, you know, um, I suppose everything I say is heartfelt um, when it comes to uh, abduction experiences. Um, uh, the choice of the, of the right person is extremely important, and then listening back to those tapes over and over again, I've heard that you. How many times did you listen to those tapes? Uh, maybe before transcribing what was on them. Probably ten times, and I have to tell you that in the very beginning, it was extremely distressing to me. Um, The story has been told over and over again by debunkers who have their own agenda and who are willing to lie uh, about what happened, Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that Barney was highly emotional and that Betty... Uh, it sounded as if she was spending a day in the supermarket. And it's very, very clear on these hypnosis tapes that uh, Barney was emotional when he felt that he was going to be captured as he was standing in a field looking up at non-humans who uh, were hovering in a craft only about a 100 feet above him. Mm-hmm. Anyone would be frightened He escaped, ran back to the car, screaming to Betty that they had to get out of there or they were going to be captured. 
after that, it appears that they had gained control over him. He then was no longer emotional throughout those tapes. But as Betty's capture began, she uh, ex- uh, displayed the same degree of emotion that Barney had dis- uh Exhibited, and she stated that she had never been so frightened in her entire life. In fact, during one of Dr. Simon's sessions with Barn with Betty, she became so emotional that he had to end the session early. And this is the session where the extraterrestrial physician plunged a needle into her navel. And we know today that the purpose of doing that is to extract ova. There was no anesthetic. She asked him not to do it. He did it anyway. And then the one she called the leader that we now know is very familiar to uh, abduction experiencers and and sees them over and over throughout their lifetime, uh, took her pain away. And this is a repeating story over and over again with the abduction experiencers that I work with. This person's job is to comfort uh, experiencers and to take their pain away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, because their lifespan is so much larger, um, it's presumed um, that they have the ability to do that. Um, There's a, a lot of other people are uh, just in the abductions in general, um, uh, don't know the date, but they know the time. It's as though they're on a schedule, and it's yes. a repeating thing. Uh, if you make it past that time in the night, you know that it's not tonight. Yes, and um, the Martin Stoner study on commonalities among abduction experiencers revealed that nearly 75% of the 50 experiencers who participated in this study have difficulty falling asleep and remaining asleep at night. And generally, it's between the hours of uh, 1 in the morning and 4 in the morning when they can't sleep. They, they are just so terrified that they might be taking, taken during that time frame uh, I've talked to many individuals who tell me it doesn't help to stay awake. If it's your time to be taken, you're going to be taken regardless of whether or not you're awake. Oh, absolutely. So I, I spoke to uh, Judy Carroll, uh, author of um, Human by Day, Theater by Night, and um, we, we joked about, about this, and I've joked about it since, but I, it, it's serious. Um, when someone is saying, oh, you know, I'd love to see a UFO, and there was someone in the chat room last week doing the same thing, and I said, well, stand next to someone who's looking at one. Yes. That's the best I could come up with. I said, because And don't get under it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And Don't stand under it. <laughs> yeah, because that's more than likely about to happen. Um, and, and I said, you know, uh, you don't communicate a week out from the event and, you know, invite them around to your house. There isn't, um, you know, a welcoming party in your front lawn. They don't land. They don't walk up to the door and knock politely on the door and you don't open the door and, you know, invite them inside. There's none of, none of the pleasantries involved in an experience with, like, friends. Even though you might know them for your whole life, you might experience them. Um, what, what are the... <sighs> For the people listening to the to the show, um, you know we we are all familiar with the Betty and Barney Hill um, experience, and and from the moment that I heard about that um, in my life, uh, it sort of it, it made me feel at ease with what was going on with me because it just mm. I wasn't not alone anymore. What what yes. are the what are the common themes to abductions? Um, that if someone's listening to this right now, they may be able to um, attach to their own experiences and 
if they feel inappropriate, go and see a professional. What kinds of things would they, what, what are the kinds of uh, the common themes? Well, I can tell you first that um, the results, the report on the Marden Stoner com- Commonality Study is on my website at uh, Kathleen with a K, K A T H L E E N hyphen Marden, M A R D E N dot com. And we have also written about it extensively in our new book, The Alien Abduction File, that can be ordered from Amazon. It can be ordered from Barnes and Noble. You can order an autographed copy from me, uh, but the, the cost of shipping it to Australia would be quite expensive. It's also going to be available on, um, I think it's five different electronic formats. So the book will be readily available. But to get to some of the uh, important results of our study, we found that 88% of those who participated, that's 50 people, stated their abduction memories were consciously recalled. So they had conscious recall for at least part of this. Actually, only 36% had had hypnosis. Wow. Uh, Although, and 88% had conscious recall of at least part of this. Um, and 67% said that they const- consciously recalled the observation of an unconventional craft at less than a thousand feet prior to an abduction. Um, 56% said that they consciously recalled the observation of non-human entities prior to an abduction while they were outside their homes. So this conscious part of this is very, very important. Uh, and, and an interesting thing is they may have been taken all of their lives and they may have had these intrusive memories or um, dreamlike experiences, but at some time, uh, perhaps when they were in their late teens or early 20s, they're outside camping or hiking or driving down the highway when they have a close encounter and missing time experience. So that is not necessarily... First, I think it might have been first with Betty and Barney Hill, but it is not necessarily the first event with every experiencer. There, um, there, seems, there seems to be a an age bracket as well, doesn't there? There's um, between, well, say, I don't know, fifty and under, fifty years and under. Well, uh, I'll tell you this. Age. This was very, very interesting to us uh, because we had read so many reports about how experiences are no no longer taken or um, rarely taken as they get older and that the primary reason for taking them is the collection of of sperm and ova. Mm -hmm. But our study showed that although the majority of individuals said that they were taken uh, for the first time when they were under age 20, they said that their experiences were ongoing right through their 50s and there were some participants who were in their 60s and their experiences were also ongoing. So that was a real surprise to us. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, 76% said they weren't alone when they were taken and 62% said that these witnesses had conscious recall of at least part of their experience. Yeah. And 43% said that there were witnesses who observed a UFO near their house or their vehicle or their tent prior to an abduction experience. 58% said they were aware of having been examined on a craft. So, you know, all of this was, was very significant, I thought, uh, the majority of women who participated, 69%, said that they had suffered gynecological problems that they thought were directly related to an abduction experience. Uh, this varied from the need to have a hysterectomy, hemorrhaging. Uh, one had uh, a laceration 
uh, in her vagina after an abduction experience. Uh, a, a woman who uh, had been had not had sexual relations in a very, very long period of time ended up with a venereal disease. Uh, wow. No, no prosaic explanation for how that could have happened. 22% of the respondents, this is a very small percentage, but highly significant because they suffered burns or conjunctivitis or hair loss immediately after an abduction experience. Uh, some had triangular burns on their back or maybe on their side uh, and a sunburn kind of effect on their bodies. Wow. 80 88% said that they had observed paranormal activity in their homes immediately after an abduction experience. Uh, what appeared to be kind of a poltergeist type activity, uh, things flying off shelves, that sort of thing. It had not occurred before the abduction. It occurred immediately thereafter. Uh, so that was that was also very interesting. Many reported that they had observed um, light orbs in their homes, mm -hmm. um, and also uh, there seemed to be electromagnetic effects and uh, appliances burning out, mm -hmm. popping out immediately after. An abduction experience. So this isn't like you, you turn on your lamp and the bulb blows out. This is a, a series of events such as you turn on the lamp, the bulb blows out. You turn on the light switch, the light blows out. You then pick up your uh, appliance and it blows out. You pick up another appliance, it blows out. You go to your computer, your computer uh, stops operating um, you go to the grocery store and the scanner does not work. You know, it, it's a series of events. It's yeah. not just one thing to say, well, this is just a coincidence. And I'll tell you that this has been so interesting to me that I have been um, measuring the uh, electric and electromagnetic fields around abduction experiencers. Uh, recently, I just uh, purchased a Trifield natural EM meter. Awesome. And what I have found, and this has been with two experiencers only, uh, you know, just because of my proximity to experiencers, I wish that I could do it with more people. And I intend to do that uh, as time goes on. But what I have found is that immediately after an abduction and for about a week, if I put it uh, on electric and they walk toward this meter, the needle will go to full capacity and make a, and sound a signal. It arcs. Whereas when I have other family members uh, as test subjects who also walk toward that meter in that exact same location, the needle barely moves. Mm -hmm. They have a much, much weaker electric field around them. It's um, incredible. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely sounds amazing. Um, I was just thinking while you were talking about that, that it could be, in fact, the reason why some people were considered special in, um, say, you know, the, the mid-centuries in Europe and painted with halos. I'm not, I don't want to touch anyone's, you know, uh, religious beliefs, but it, it could certainly be something that you would describe, and the only way to describe it was by painting a halo around them. Uh, we all know about the um, the energy fields around people. Uh, what was that? What's that test? What's that photography method of being able to see the... Oh, uh, Curlian photography? Yeah, Is Curlian that photography. Thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, fruit and vegetables, anything, the all living matter has, has uh, electric field that you can measure, but um, yes. it, it can be described. Um, maybe that's the power of telepathy. Maybe that's, um, you know, I, I don't want to speculate too too hard on that, but um, certainly it sounds completely plausible to me that there's a there's a difference um, 
in my house alone, I've lost all the appliances down at one end of the house at one go, even though they're all on separate circuit breakers, even to the point where I have to reset some other appliances outside at the same end of the house, which is the, um, the end of the house that would be uh, more than likely used. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to also ask, um, in the, in the description of the people, when you're mentioning the percentages of those people who have had different kinds of effects, one of those things, um, that you didn't mention, this has happened to a friend of mine, um, that, uh, a fetus was grown inside her and then removed. She was over the moon because she wasn't, um, having very much luck with, uh, with doing that the manual way. And when she discovered she was pregnant, uh, she was, you know, uh, jubilant. But then only to discover it when she went back for the second, um, scan to see how, you know, check on that baby's heartbeat. There was nothing there at all. And that is quite common. Now mm-hmm. that was not a part of the Martin Stoner commonality study. It wasn't a question that we asked in this particular study. We had 45 questions. We could have asked a hundred, but we thought that, uh, it would be difficult to get. The longer it was, the more difficult it would be to, to find people who are willing to spend the time to fill out mm-hmm. this, this questionnaire and to speak with us, uh, about their experiences. But I can tell you, that in the alien abduction files, every case that I wrote about where a female was involved, there was also uh, this removal of a fetus or insertion of a fetus. Mm-hmm. So you have they don't normally case see it. after Pardon they me? Don't, so they don't normally see it full term either. No, uh, they see it on a craft being raised in an artificial gestational sac in in a type of tube in an artificial environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then um, many people have reported uh, observing what they believe are hybrid beings that are their part uh, ET, part human. Uh, And, And they're also made aware through telepathy, or just a, an understanding, um, feeling of love, that these are theirs. Yes, absolutely. And they're asked to bond with these uh, little sort of emaciated uh, individuals that, that they are made to understand of their own children. There, some women are asked to uh, to breastfeed them, although they don't have milk. They want the, them to, to go to their breasts. They want that to to cuddle them, and we know, um, you know, my background is in sociology and psychology. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know the consequence of raising a child without human love, without that touching, without that nurturing. Uh, a human can never be fully human. There are all sorts of emotional problems that arise, and uh, there's a failure to thrive syndrome. Oh, wow. Um, and and uh, the inability to bond with other humans, with other beings, uh, it, it causes great psychological damage. So I think that the reason for this bonding kind of exercise is in order to attempt to uh, rear emotionally healthy uh, hybrids on board these craft. Well, it, it makes sense. If- if, if they, if, you know, if all the ifs are true, that they, they're from somewhere else, they've come here, you know, just using, you know, well, let's, let's, I'm going to propose another one. Um, I'm a big fan of the ancient technology and ancient aliens theories that they have been here for some time or, um, you know, and if you look at the ancient cultures, they all talk about us being made, um, from the star people making us look like them or you know we already look like them or they look like us already um that this would just make complete sense so where where these kind of creatures we have these kind of brains and um like you said sociologically sociologically 
that was nearly a word, sociologically, um, that that uh, cures a, a bunch of ailments. Uh, one of the one of the other things uh, were implants um, for abductees. Um, yes. For for whatever purpose uh, that I don't think we fully comprehend yet. Um, how was that part of your study? Um, this one, or was it in the the previous research? Uh, it was part of this particular study, mm-hmm. and fifty three percent of those who participated stated that they could feel an al- what they thought was an alien implant in their body. The majority of participants indicated that it was located in their head, including temple, eye, nose, behind ear, and others, uh, or eyebrow, and others stated groin. Other areas mentioned was spine, lower leg, hand, chest, and vagina. Now, I have, uh, I am currently working with two separate abduction experiencers who have uh, shown me what they believed was an implant. I've been able to palpitate it under the skin mm-hmm. and watch it on one of these as over uh, a week, a seven day period, it moved up the arm into the shoulder and then disappeared into the body. So some of these appear to move. It's almost as if they're inserted but that is the, lo- the location of insertion is not where it's going to end up. Um, wow. And actually, I can tell you that my co-author, Denise Stoner, is one of those people that I have observed this in. Wow. Uh, so very, very interesting to me. And the work of Roger Lear, Dr. W- Roger Lear in the United States, in uh, on the other side, Coast from where I am. I'm in Florida on the East Coast. He's in California on the West Coast. He testified uh, at the citizens' hearings on disclosure in Washington, yes. D.C. this week. Mm-hmm. And uh, he has been working with Stephen Colburn, who is a material scientist. And they have uh, uh, discovered that these implants have very unusual properties. Uh, Roger said quite a long time ago that they were coated with some kind of biological substance that they cannot identify that prevents them from being rejected by the human body. This has significant implications for the medical community. Just think of what would happen if we had uh, could coat organs for organ transplants with this kind of material, and a person would never have to take an anti-rejection drug. This would this would be a huge breakthrough in medicine for us. The implants that Dr. Lear has removed uh, attach to nerve endings. They seem to have their own almost consciousness. Uh, they uh, seem to be able to communicate with the individual that they're implanted in, and it is also seems to be a way that the ETs can track this individual and perhaps communicate with this individual. They the recently, uh, Stephen Colburn, the material scientist, has discovered that they are nanotechnology, and. Uh, this is has been very, very important. Uh, also, they appear to be able to transmit into deep space. And uh, for more information on that, I highly recommend that you follow Dr. Roger Lear, uh, because I'm I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not that type of scientist, and I'm only paraphrasing what he has stated. Uh, this is a very important find. Dr. Lear believes that he has the smoking gun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, discovering anything that isn't that doesn't have the same quantity of of uh, materials found on Earth it is certainly something on its own. Yes, and they're made. Excuse me. Yep. Uh, they're made from meteoric material and rare earths. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, just as we've been finding that, you know, the, the moon has, um, a, a different chemical makeup as well. Um, we can only presume Mars does as well. Each planet has, you know, um, the typical things that you would find in it in certain quantities, uh, you know, uh, as a percentage against the other mass. So, yeah, I, I've been looking at the same thing, um, trying to do a bit more research and, and following his work uh, quite uh, substantially there. I noticed that there's a connection between Stanford Friedman and Carl Sagan, that they were schoolmates. Just how differently they turned out, yeah? Well, they both turned out as scientists. Stan was a, a nuclear physicist. And they both graduated from the University of Chicago. Stan uh, completed his master's degree in physics and had a family to support. He had married and decided to go out and work in private industry, which he did for many, many years um, in the space industry. Carl Sagan went on to, um, to earn his doctorate. And Carl... Uh, is a scientist who became, I believe, highly political and was asked, actually in 1966, uh, to sit on the Air Force's committee that was going to discuss whether or not they should do a scientific study on UFOs. And Carl Sagan, uh, later on, wrote to the uh, well-known Debunker, probably the the biggest propagandist in the 20th century uh, to debunk UFOs, and this was Philip Class. I went to Philip Class's archival collection uh, in Philadelphia. It's at the American Philosophical Society, and there I saw letters where Philip Class was chiding Sagan for being too much of a believer. And Sagan said, well, it was his idea to conduct a, a, a skeptical study of UFOs. And, and Carl, I believe, is fairly responsible for this effort uh, throughout uh, probably a 30 to 40 year period of uh, putting the topic of UFOs in a different category than science. Uh, Although early on, he seemed to be very, very interested. It's almost as if someone got a hold of him and he went on someone's payroll. Uh, and I, can't, I have no evidence of that, but I'm just uh, observing his behavior over this period of time. Uh, eventually, uh, Carl started to write articles. They were debunking articles. And these were articles in which he presented false information about the Betty and Barney Hill case. And this was distressing to me and to others. And Stanton Friedman was one of those. And both of us wrote to Carl to inform him of the facts. And we discovered that he wasn't really interested in the facts that he was interested in uh, disseminating information of a particular agenda, and that was a debunking kind of agenda. I can't blame him entirely. I think that perhaps uh, he got a lot of this false information from Philip Class, because eventually I could trace almost every false statement to Philip Class. And so uh, I, I would fault Carl for maybe not doing his homework. But then I wonder when he was given the correct information, why he decided to continue to disseminate false information about the Hill case. Uh, so I don't know. It's a big mystery uh, to me. I've, I've been able to follow some links uh, I've been able to follow this history of, of cover-up by going to archival collections. Um, Carl Sagan did a series for public television, and in that series, uh, the Hill case was depicted. Oh. It showed Betty and Barney 
uh, driving in the dark of night, which was, was true, only it wasn't that dark. It was a bright light night in New Hampshire. Uh, it showed torrential downpours. Well, actually, it was a bright light night. Uh, the stars were visible. The moon was nearly full. Why? Can you tell me why they would depict torrential downpours? As Betty is nervously looking up at a bright light overhead. You see, it was Carl's contention that all Betty ever saw and all what Barney ever saw was a bright light in the sky, even though I present the documented evidence that they saw a structured craft. It hovered only 200 feet above their vehicle. Barney walked into the field, looked at it, and observed beings that he stated were somehow, and this is, quote, somehow not human Unquote. And he stated that in October of 1961, only a month after their UFO encounter in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, on September 26th of that same year, only six days after they arrived home from this incident, Betty wrote a letter to Donald Kehoe, was, who was the head of NICAP, Major Donald Kehoe, and described what she and Barney had observed and also mentioned the people dressed in shiny black uniforms. I shouldn't say people. She said figures Mm -hmm. uh, that frightened Barney so terribly. And uh, the evidence is there of what Betty and Barney saw. Uh, It's not difficult to find. Yet this lie was depicted for public television of Betty's and Barney's experience. And, you know, I am so committed to setting the record straight. Uh, Betty and Barney didn't deserve this. They never even wanted their story to be made public. It was made public through a violation of confidentiality. Uh, So the least we can do is look at the truth, examine the facts. I also have an article on my website at Kathleen-Marden, M-A-R-D-E-N dot com, uh, titled Where the Debunkers Went Wrong in the Betty and Barney Hill Case. And it gives documented evidence uh, about what actually did happen and the false information that's being disseminated by a small group of very vocal debunkers. These are, these are prominent people, though, aren't they? Um, yes, genius. they are prominent mm-hmm. people. And, you know, what better way to, uh, to spread a falsehood than to have it done by a prominent scientist? Who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe a woman who is a retired social worker whose husband is already dead? who this was, um, Betty's also passed now. She died in 2004. Mm-hmm. But this happened during the 80s and 90s. Are you going to believe this little individual? Or are you going to believe the prominent scientist who's saying, oh, this woman is wrong? She wasn't wrong. Mm-hmm. I have the documented evidence that she wasn't wrong. It's in the files. I hear your conviction with this. How did it get leaked? If they didn't want it published... And it was just their own personal experience. And, of course, all the debunkers use this as a test case to debunk the entire lot. How did it come about that it was leaked? Well, Betty and Barney were attempting to to learn more about UFOs. They had no prior knowledge of UFOs prior to their close encounter, except for that my mother had observed uh probably what we'd think of as a mothership with smaller craft flying around it back in 1957. Mm -hmm. She'd mentioned it briefly. I didn't even know about it until 1961. The family didn't uh, labor over it or or show much interest in it. I came from a family interested in politics and and world affairs. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, what had happened is that Betty and Barney had spoken to a few 
scientists who were interested in their case. And they then uh, were invited to the two-state study group in Quincy, Massachusetts. And this was in November of 1963. It was a UFO study group uh, where they were going to perhaps learn more about UFOs. And so they went and they were asked to uh, stand up and say a few words to the group about their own uh, experience. They, they spent a few minutes. They weren't on the agenda. There were people there that they met at that group, and one of those people uh, was a woman uh, from that area in Massachusetts who happened to live in the same town as a newspaper reporter who worked for the Boston Traveler. Now, I believe that Betty confided information to this woman, hmm. and this woman then violated confidentiality and confided this information to the newspaper reporter who then wrote a letter to Betty and Barney stating that this woman uh, had spoken very highly of them and how he would like to interview them because if they're nearly as nice as she said, he would just love to talk to them about their UFO experience. Uh, Betty and Barney said, absolutely not. This is confidential. We never want anyone except for scientists to know about this. No. Two months later, the articles appeared in the newspaper. They ran for five nights. It was based upon hearsay. They were not entirely accurate. Mm -hmm. That is when Betty and Barney decided to cooperate with John G. Fuller who uh, was an author who was writing about UFOs at that time, well-known author, in fact. He wrote The Incident at Exeter. He ha um, later wrote the article for Look Magazine about the, uh, the hoax uh, of the Condon Committee's investigation mm -hmm. that it was a put-up deal. Yeah, um, yeah. So he, they agreed to work with him in permitting him to write The Interrupted Journey, which was the first book written about their experience. It was a New York Times bestseller. While I can't not ask your opinion on it, the question that I was going to ask next was, what quantity of misinformation have you stumbled onto? But we all know that it started with the U.S. military industrial complexes the, uh, the citizens hearing at the moment is bringing a lot of stuff to light, which has been just tremendous. But you mentioned the Condon report. What's the word for that letter? It was the trick memo, wasn't it? Yes, it was the trick memo. It was written by uh, Robert Lowe, uh, who was the project coordinator at the, the University of Colorado. for, And it was written in August of 1966. It was written to um, the um, president of the university and various uh, members who were in a uh, decision-making body about whether or not to accept this project. And he was explaining to them that to uh, the, the public, this would appear to be a legitimate scientific study, but to the scientists involved, it would... Uh, show almost no indication that UFOs were real. He went on to talk about how uh, it was not respectable to study UFOs mm -hmm. uh, and that the uh, recommendation would be made that this would be better studied and respectable if it were done so by the social research community and that social scientists could well uh, receive funds in which to study those who reported observations of UFOs. And, of course, the, the intention was to figure out what was wrong with them, why they would come to believe something that wasn't really true. And then, of course, that carried on. Uh, through history, um, and uh, many studies were done, not just on observers, but on those who reported that they had been abducted by 
extraterrestrials. And in the end, it had to have been an embarrassment because all of those studies indicated that those who uh, had the uh, cri- met the criteria for having had a real abduction experience were no more fantasy prone or psychiatrically uh, in, uh, predisposed predisposed or disabled or whatever you want to call it, uh, than the general population. In other words, these people are sane. They're not suffering from personality disorders. For the most part, some are, but for the most part, no. These These are real experiences that people are having, and it's being covered up at the highest levels of government, uh, even above the president of the United States from what I have been able to discover and from the sworn testimony that was given by scientists and by former members of the military this week in Washington, D.C., over a five-day period, eight hours a day. I've I've been um, uh, keeping very close eye on whatever I'm able to from there. I can't go to the website. It won't let me view it from this country. Thank you very much, whoever made that up. Um, but I'm fortunate enough to have the ability to um, to watch what people from YouTube have posted. And it's, I, I'll tell you, I think we're living in a new world where this information is going public. It's, well, it's, I changing, certainly it's changing hope the world. So. Yes, and, and fortunately we have the Internet. So uh, the Internet does not censor. The press, the internet uh, disseminates information, and, and it's a very, very good thing that we have, so that those who want to seek out that kind of information, seek out the truth, have it accessible to them, at least uh, in a limited way. Oh yeah, look, and it does a good job at that. Uh, whether it's um whether the information is good or not. So disinf- or sorry, not disinformation. <laughs> well, the disinformation is passed in that way as well. Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to dif- differentiate between uh, the truth and the disinformation, unfortunately. You know, all good researchers, that's what you have to do. You have to Absolutely. Take, take the wheat with the chaff and work out what's what. Um, mm-hmm. um, I remember uh, when we were lining up an interview uh, over the last six months or more, um, one of the things that that I, I thought was an important topic to raise with you was has there been a difference in the relative quantity of sightings to abductions over time? Has it has it been ramping up? Has it fallen away? Has the uh, the differential between the two as a percentage? Oh, sorry, as a you know. A ratio have they tipped tipped in one way or the other has a has maybe um, have the style of the abductions changed? Can you tell me more about that in your role <laughs> as in MUFON? Yes, absolutely um, well in in terms of the number and style of abductions, uh, they seem to have started about nineteen fifty seven with the Antonio Vias Boas case. In Brazil, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, he was uh, a farmer who was out in his field plowing at night. Uh, and uh, he and his brother had a close encounter with a UFO. And a few nights later, he was uh, one actually landed, uh, disabled his tractor, took him on board the craft and uh, gave him a physical examination and a tour of the craft. Uh, He ended up with radiation, what appeared to be radiation burns. He was ill, uh, had a lot of weight loss after that. And this story wasn't made public in the United States until after the Betty and Barney Hill story became public. Um, So we passed through a number of years. We go to 1961 there's Betty and Barney. Um, the next significant case that I have uh, information about occurred in Vermont in 1968 or 69, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. Very well investigated by Walter Webb, the same NICAP investigator. He was an astronomer. 
He invest was the first investigator on the Betty and Barney Hill case. A uh, young couple worked at a camp. Uh, she was 19, a college student at Smith. Uh, he was a teenager, high school student who uh, worked at that camp just taking care of the equipment. The two of them were out on the dock uh, early in the evening. The other members of the camp had gone uh, to a swim meet when they saw uh, what appeared to be a large uh, cigar-shaped mothership. It discharged smaller craft. Uh, some flew away. One flew toward them. Uh, it uh, rose up into the air. It then d- descended vertically, plunged into the lake, then rose up out of the lake and just over the top of the water came in their direction. Uh, they was, continued to stand on the pier looking out at this, uh, at this craft. They observed non-humans in the craft looking back at them. The, the young woman then appeared to be in a trance-like state. The young man uh, pushed her and himself down onto the deck. The craft came overhead. The next thing they knew, uh, the craft was leaving. They heard voices. Uh, time had passed, a couple of hours, mm-hmm. and the swimmers were back from their meet. This is very well investigated, uh, very convincing case. Uh, In the early 70s, there were more and more uh, reports. There was the the Pascagoula, Mississippi abduction of Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker. They were out uh, fishing on a pier at the Salpita um, uh, shipyard. It was a closed shipyard. Uh, when a craft came in and abducted them. Very, very frightening, very convincing. Uh, then we had um, the Travis Walton case. Mm-hmm. There were there were other cases in there, um, but Travis Walton was abducted from the White Mountains of Arizona. He was on a logging crew. They were clearing uh, brush in the National Forest driving home in a crew cab at night down the side of the mountain when they observed uh, this UFO. Uh, They realized as the truck came closer that it was actually a structured craft. Travis got out of the the truck, walked toward the craft, was hit by a beam of light, uh, threw him into the air. The other men were uh, terrified. They took off down the road eventually decided that they should turn around and see if they could find Travis. They thought that he was probably injured or killed. He was missing. Uh, There was, uh, it became a police case. Um, There was a missing persons report filed, and all of the members of the crew were under suspicion for having perhaps killed Travis. Mm -hmm. They all underwent uh, lie detector tests about what they saw and what they thought happened to Travis. Um, They passed the lie detector test, except for one who walked out. He was so angry um, at the implication. At at the implications, yeah, being thrown at it. Yes. Travis showed up five days later. This was November of the year. There were search crews sent out looking for him. Uh, A very convincing case. He's still speaking about it. When, when uh, he turned up, they were still searching for him. Yes. They saw yes, an active part searching, in searching yeah. Yes, yes. He was traumatized by this, uh, dehydrated. He lost weight. He had five days beard growth. He had conscious recall for what had occurred on board the craft. Mm-hmm. J- Dr. James Harder also hypnotized Travis and uh, Jim really wasn't able to uh, obtain any more information than what Travis recalled consciously. It's interesting that Jim also uh, hypnotized Betty Hill back in the 1970s. He hypnotized members of my own family who had close encounters Mm -hmm. with UFOs, and he hypnotized Jenny Henderson, who is one of the experiencers that I wrote about very extensively in the alien abduction files because I ended up 
with her case, investigating her case as years went on, and she permitted me uh, to write about her experiences and the messages that she had received during these serial abductions, multi-generational serial abductions that she and her family had experienced. So getting back to, (laughs) jumping back into the 70s, there were many other uh, abductions reported in that time frame. Uh, There were three women from Kentucky, uh, Casey County, Kentucky, Mona Stafford, uh, Elaine Thomas, and Louise Smith, who were returning home after uh, a dinner, a birthday dinner at a restaurant, when a UFO came down in, at close range, uh, hovered over their vehicle, then uh, flew along beside their car, shining uh, a beam of light into the car. It made uh, their eyes burn, their flesh tingle. They felt warmth from it. The next thing they knew, the car was going uh, 80 miles an hour uh, on its own. The women couldn't stop it, even applying the brakes. Then all of a sudden, it started moving backward, uh, and they just remembered sort of going up this uh, long road that they had never observed before, mm-hmm. and the next thing they knew, they were out on the outskirts of the town that they lived in, and they were missing nearly two hours' time. They lost weight. They they suffered these burns on their backs, just like some other experiencers, uh, conjunctivitis, uh, irritation of the con- conjunctiva of the eye. They have uh, all sorts of physiological problems as well. And uh, then during the 80s, these abductions increased more and more and more. Um, the extended family started to be taken um, the, it appears that these re- reproductive experiments were in full swing, and it has gone on from there. I have reason to wonder if it's winding down a bit now, and the only reason for that is I'm receiving full, fewer and fewer reports from young people. Now, I don't know if they're not reporting this because they're concerned about their careers, about their reputations, what might happen if somehow this information were leaked, if through a violation of confidentiality, I would certainly never violate confidentiality. But, you know, we know that it's happened in the past, particularly with my aunt and uncle. Um, and so I don't know if that's the reason or if this program is winding down. Or if the screen memories are getting better. Well, certainly uh, in the very beginning, we had a lot of physical evidence. Mm -hmm. In my aunt and uncle's case, we had more physical evidence than in any other case. Betty's, the dress Betty was wearing that night was torn in several locations. It's undergone scientific analysis in five separate laboratories. No one has ever been able to identify the pink powdery substance that was deposited upon that dress or grew upon that dress. Um, you can read about that in the book Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Um, now, it's very, very difficult to get any kind of physical evidence this is happening. Uh, The process of wiping out memories seems to be far better. People are now taken uh, through walls and windows. They weren't back then. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were taken from their vehicles and walked on or or floated on to these craft. But they, you know, it wasn't happening when people were asleep that we know of. And so it seems that the ETs became more and more sophisticated in the the procurement process and how to do it as seamlessly as possible. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to interject there, and and because uh, I've talked about my experiences on on, on the show before, and um, one of those I had the extra, well, you know, the outside of the house experience, and. Um, but what happens more so now is the 
it seems as though they take half a step or lean in from a different maybe they're out of phase and when they lean in they lean into the bubble that we live in and they're able to examine through through that or it, it's difficult to to explain they take one step and they're in your room they take one step and they're out of your room um uh, you know, I've had my children screaming from the other room and my partner lying next to me making the most hideous noise you've ever heard. Uh, tonal, every, every exhale was a sound and that freaked me out. I'm looking at her, yeah. not understanding what, what's she doing? Why are my kids screaming? I've got to help them that they're in, they're in trouble. And, um, and, I looked to my left and standing next to my bed was a, uh, a small gray face pretty much right up to my head, uh, mm-hmm. a few inches away. And they said, no. And I was asleep again. But yes. I, I looked at, I looked at the clock. I recognized what time it was on the clock. I was, I was, you know, upright in bed. I was concerned. Um, yet this, when you, when your kids make a sound, that you know that they're in trouble and they're fearing something extraordinary. My, my daughter now talks about the little bears that come and take her away. Mm-hmm. She even walked me in the forest because we live in a forest. She walked me to the spot. She, she said, this is where they live, but she's confused looking around saying, you know what? I, I don't understand, but this is where their house was. And I look up and there's a, um, a circular clearing up through the, the tree canopy. And I know what I'm looking at. I don't have to do much research. She describes, you know, them coming to her room and taking her out through the window, she said, but it doesn't open. Yes. Oh. We've all woken up in our house with bleeding noses. Yes. And I know what I'm looking at when I see this because I know it. And they're unexplainable. I even had, this is just, this is me, but I'll go off me in a second. Um, I had my nose cauterized so it could never mm-hmm. bleed. And it doesn't come from where your fingers can reach, yeah? To yes. put it bluntly, it's up inside the nasal passage. Um, yes. That's the origin of it. And I'm convinced from when I was a child that they put something in there. And, um, and I don't know if it's alive. Sometimes I feel like it's, it moves or it crawls around. Um, in the Steven Spielberg Taken series, where it looks like it's the 40s, late 40s possibly, and they have a small, uh, it looks like a small implant, but as soon as they extract it, it turns into an insect-like thing. Mm-hmm. If you haven't seen that, I can only imagine, that's, and that's what I do, um, try to imagine what it what it is that they put in there. But I've got some implants in my neck and my arm, and I tried to have one removed um, at the same time as having a 50-cent piece size bit of hair behind my right ear looked at. And the, the doctor at the time said that there was no hair follicles whatsoever, and I hope I'm freaking people out who are listening to this. Um, but anyway, I know this stuff is, and it's real because it's happening to me, and I didn't consider it happening to anyone until I was first conscious of it happening. And when you mentioned this a bit earlier, that's it really, you know, out of the ballpark. It hit it out of the ballpark. Um, are, are we looking, do you think that some of their work, if, um, uh, what's it, uh, Moulton Howe, um, Linda Moulton Howe. Yeah. Do you, do, Linda talked about in the citizens hearing um, that it's a, a DNA harvest. Um, and that's her point of view. Uh, are you, are we looking here at maybe changes both to the alien and the human behavior through this process of abduction? Do, do you think there's anything? Well, I think that there's a DNA harvest, but I think that there's more going on than just a DNA harvest. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are also emotional experiences going on, uh, experiments going on uh, on these craft. Uh, Individuals are being educated 
I have uh, wrote about uh, Jenny Henderson's son, and I do want to to just mention that the Henderson family uh, had all of these experiences that you have just mentioned happening to your own family. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, uh, in in one that I've written about in the book, it occurred in 1988. Uh, the ETs came into her home. Her husband actually sprung up out of bed before he was put down and paralyzed. Mm -hmm. She was awake. She was uh, sort of sitting up a little bit uh, before she was paralyzed and then taken. Her children were also taken. Uh, One of them even talked the next day about the funny little uh, house that he was taken to outside Mm -hmm. the house that night. And the other child um, and, and you know, it was the, that was the little girl who said that. Yeah. And uh, the, the the brother, this little girl's brother, talked over and over again about the symbols that he had uh, observed on the craft. Apparently, he seemed to be a student of these symbols that would play over and over again in his head. And these symbols are the same symbols that Betty Hill drew and that Bud Hopkins experiencers Mm -hmm. drew uh, separately. They were kept separate and in closed files, and you put them together, and they are almost identical. So there is all of this evidence that this is is going on. Um, It is just remarkable that it's being covered up uh, by the media and by uh, the military, industrial, financial establishment. Mm-hmm. And I think that that has been very well established in Washington this week at the hearings. Now, in the book, I also wrote about uh, the physics behind uh, the procurement process. How is it possible for these extraterrestrials to be able to come through a solid surface and move the the human body through this solid surface. Mm -hmm. I've talked to several physicists about this, and the explanation that I received is that in physics, all you have to do is match up frequency and phase of the human and the solid object. So we know that everything has a vibrational frequency. Uh, an animate object has a higher vibrational frequency than an inanimate object. But if you can arrange the frequency and the fray phase so that they are the same, then matter can pass through matter. And the physicist said, remember that 99% of the atom is empty space yeah. between the neurons and the electrons. Mm-hmm. So... It is possible, and he said that we have even done it on a very small scale in a laboratory. So throughout the alien abduction files, I uh, discuss the uh, alternative explanations and also uh, give the scientific explanations for what seems to be going on here. And the Jenny Henderson case is extremely important. I had hoped that she would permit me to give her real name, but there were concerns about uh, her her and her husband's uh, prominence in the community in which they live, their business. There were all sorts of uh, reasons why they couldn't go public, but the story was so important. I had to, she permitted me as long as I would fictionalize part of this and about their her history and about her name and that sort of thing. The story is 100% accurate. Yeah, that you know it, that's it's an incredible thing and it, it's difficult to. Uh, I I made the step just to say you know I want to live my life in the skin that's real. Yeah. I don't want I don't want to lie to anyone anymore. And it's one of those things that I, I know what they're going through because. Uh, and unless you make that step, it's um, it could be considered the same. And uh, please 
please correct me if I'm wrong, um, as though, you know, rape victims, um, raped at a young age would keep, they conceal. They conceal that kind of thing to themselves. They're not allowed to tell anyone. They don't want to tell anyone. There's ridicule involved. Who knows? But it's a personal thing and they, they'll take that as far as they, you know, until it kills them or it breaks them. Yes, and it's emotionally damaging, and it's unfortunate Absolutely. that we have this air of secrecy and the ad hominem attacks upon people who have these kinds of experiences, the uh, concerted effort to destroy these individuals who are only reporting their truth. So, and it's, unfortunately. It's, it's painful, and, and once you can live in your skin, um, you know, it makes a big difference to your life. Yes, that is true. And my co-author, Denise Stoner, and her husband, Ed, have come forward for the first time. Their first missing time experience occurred in 1982 in Colorado, and they kept this information secret for all of these years and have finally come forward with their story. And it's a very important one. A lot of evidence that this was real, um, a, um, being in, in one location as they were traveling through a valley between the mountains, uh, finding themselves observing these bright lights coming toward them very rapidly, feel, feeling the car shift off the road. The next thing they know, as if only a moment has passed, mm -hmm. they are 40 miles away going up a mountain pass. It was daylight before. It was le not even 7 o'clock at night. Now it's 11 o'clock at night. It's pitch black. They're freezing. Uh, they have no idea what has happened in the interim. Um, an amazing story. I did uh, the hypnosis with Denise and with Ed. Uh, Denise had also seen uh, Dr. Romack in Denver, Colorado, prior, many years prior to coming to me and, and speaking to me about this and my assistance with the investigation of the case. Wow. It is That's, just incredible. Mm -hmm. yep. And there was not only one missing time experience. Ed and Denise had two missing time experiences that I've written about in the book. And Denise has given her own uh, perspective upon all of this using her own words from her memoirs, from her diaries, from things that she has written about uh, how this feels, what happens. She now feels that uh, this began way back when she was about two and a half years old. Mm -hmm. And her mother has now come forward to state that she believes that she was also an abduction experiencer. Um, wow. Yeah, my Pretty grandmother, expensive. my grandmother in her deathbed described, um, a white sphere about a foot across dancing in her garden and she was observing it through the kitchen window and it disappeared around the side of the house and it, it, it froze for a moment while it was dancing around the garden and she knew she had a communication with it. It's come inside the house on its own navigated around furniture only to confront her in the kitchen and she backed up against the, the cupboard and was frozen in fear and she mm -hmm. said that she realized she was having another communication with it where it was going to be okay there's nothing wrong they didn't even have a clock they lived mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in a farm in the mountains and mm -hmm. it then left out the other door. So it went in the front or out in the back and came, went out the other way. And my mother in her deathbed, we never spoke about it. Our family never talked about anything. <laughs> and you don't mm -hmm. find this stuff out. I swear you've got to be next to them when they're passing away just to get information out of them. Um, and my mother said, uh, that, that she'd seen the orange orbs and that she was terribly frightened as a kid. Um, and ever since, and so when I discovered it happened to me, and um, uh, it just added more information and more questions that 
I don't know how people do it. Um, I, are we are we looking like we're changing? Uh, certainly, this the question comes up. Uh, the citizens' hearing is, is a great thing, and yes, I have to answer yes to this in, in advance. But how much are we changing in our approach to accepting aliens into our culture, and how do you think we're doing it? Well, I think that that many individuals are accepting aliens into our culture. That uh, more than than half. Uh, believe that we are being visited, and uh, certainly uh, their culture is very different than ours. Their method of communication is very different than ours. Uh, and but I think that uh, more and more we're beginning to realize that this is real. That we have to acknowledge that this is real. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is through the Internet, uh, through conferences, through individuals talking to others, through uh, these disclosure hearings. You know, and in fact, I was, David Bassett had invited me to, uh, to speak at another hearing that he was going to have, I think, later in the summer, where individuals were going to talk about their family, family experiences it doesn't appear that that's going to happen now. The Congress uh, men and women who were at these hearings felt that uh, it wouldn't be useful to, to do that. They're pushing now for uh, U.N. hearings about all of this. Uh, so it looks like it might go to the United Nations. I certainly hope if it does, I have the opportunity to testify on behalf of my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do have to tell you that... Uh, not long before my mother died, she confessed to me that she was also an experiencer. And my 90-year-old father has told me that he felt that he had had experiences as well. And these might have begun to occur uh, when my Aunt Betty was cooperating with a team of scientists in attempting to vector in craft to my grandparents' farm, mm-hmm. Um I grew up across the street from their farm in Kingston, New Hampshire. Uh, a neighbor of ours who was, re- he was a commercial pilot. He was returning home from work one night. He saw a UFO come in and land on the property. My grandparents were awoken. They saw it. My brother, younger brother was awoken. We went out. We saw the physical trace evidence on the ground the following morning. Betty and uh, a UFO investigator came and collected that evidence. Uh, it seems that perhaps in doing her experience, uh, experiments with this team, the ETs uh, interpreted this as being an invitation to take other family members. I'm not sure about that, uh, but it's, it's speculation on my part. Uh, So it seems to have moved beyond Betty and Barney to other family members. Wow. You know, I'm sort of, uh, that's that's amazing. And um, Kathleen, I I hope you guys, uh, I'm sure with your your intelligence and education that you're able to um, to work through the you know the outcome of finding out what. What what are the implications of it? Um, Yes, I fully understand the implications. mm -hmm. Um, I I bought my children a trampoline of all things for Christmas. Um, I chose one that was highly safety, you know, um, rated. Couldn't afford the most expensive one, but I I went for you know an economical one, one next down from it that's highly rated. I get it home and I'm putting it together and on the trampoline mat itself was an extraordinary thing and it was so extraordinary to this day that I'm still, it's only last Christmas, right? Um, I'm, it's still very important and I want to bring this up. It, the mat has um, a mirrored version of, of icons so the kids can jump and play games or whatever, I don't know. Um, I can only imagine if you're a child, you're going to see the, the icons on there. And they're, if you put your two feet together on the mat, that's pretty how much how big they are if you're an adult. One of the icons is that there's a series of them. One is fire, and it's easily distinguishable. 
international yeah. symbol. Kids can recognize it as fire. There's another one, flower. Um, there's a puppy's face, a lightning bolt. I think there's the sun, a smiley face, and then a gray alien face. Interesting. <laughs> I kid you not. And I thought, well, if that's not social conditioning, I don't know what is. There would have been a committee to decide what was going to be put on the mat. This icon isn't a normal icon. It's been made. I can't find a likeness of it anywhere on the Internet. So it's certainly been manufactured and agreed upon that this is going to be a good thing. Um, I'm completely flabbergasted. I know that, you know, um, the movie Paul has a, a grey alien that is friendly and jokes around. Um, you know, Alf was an alien from the 80s. That yes. lived with the family. We, we've seen a number of those. You know, I, I grew up with My Favourite Martian, the mm -hmm. show. Um, outside of all the aliens that hurt you uh, in the movies, because that's popular, um, but there's once again another theme there where we all band together are better than them. We, you know, it's all good. But the ones that are friendly, um, it looks like that's an ever increasing uh, amount of, you know, public awareness. And I think that might also lend towards people's acceptance of it, or maybe like a social conditioning. So what's your thoughts on that? You know, I've, Certainly, it might be social conditioning. The other side of that story might be uh, an attempt to convince people who are having these experiences that it's only a matter of what they've seen or heard in the media mm -hmm. and that they're fantasizing these experiences. So, uh, you know, you could look at both sides of the coin. But, uh, you know, Perhaps it is social conditioning, and I certainly hope that it is because this is real. They are here. There's overwhelming evidence that they're here and that there is a cover-up at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. um, so you, before you were saying that the abductions, um, they're, they're trailing, the abductions seem to tra be trailing off for the young people. Um, is th is there a higher amount of people now recalling, uh, say, the screen memory, memories are, are disappearing or whatever the reason for it? Are there um, are more uh, older people suddenly realizing that they've been you know, uh, an experiencer all their life? I would say that more and more older people are coming to me to tell me that they had these experiences younger, when they were younger and might have been outside and they had a missing time experience, but they were so busy with their lives, their day-to-day -day lives, their jobs, everything that they were doing, that they had never looked into it. And now they're retired. It's time to look into it. And many of them, they, these people believe that they have been taken over and over again. Among those who realize that they have been taken, I'm finding that there is more and more conscious recall for what has occurred. So we have two things that appears going on here. Hmm. No, that's that's great. Yes. No, that's, that, that's, that's really different. That, that's a different picture than, than before. Um, I... I one of the other things that, that people would um, talk about uh, communication with the aliens themselves um, during their abduction experience um, isn't isn't spoken. That's correct. It's telepathic. Mm -hmm. um, and and that there's also different roles that the um, that the aliens, depending on what size and shape. They are what, where maybe they're, where they come from or what race they are. I don't know how you would best describe them. Um, uh, I myself, I, I've seen a Nordic and uh, the small greys. I don't recognise any others. I only presume, and I don't want to be put into the into the realm of um, uh, the the mid size 
I think not the taller. I don't think I've seen the taller. I was regressed once, I have to say, Kathleen. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and I saw myself being walked. Well, I, I, I was myself, but I was holding the hands of two, uh, I'd say mid-sized because I was very, very small, um, aliens, um, with large, you know, the, the, t- the typical gray look. Um, okay. But they were a little whiter in, in, in what I saw. Um, is, it's a very comforting experience. I think when you're in, in their presence and you're conscious, it's, I don't, I, I, outside of the medical component of it and the initial fear, um, there's, it feels like the warmest love that you can ever experience. Absolutely. Uh, it can't even be described. And yes. The quantity of information that, and the start, it's not like the conversation we're having. They don't say hi and you go, hi, it's all good, how you doing? How you right. Doing? It's more like a download yeah. of information. Mo- a, a very thick bandwidth of a uh, mixture of imagery and yes. uh, emotion with that as well. And there's also words being put over the top. Yes. Um, and it's compact and you, it takes a while for you to go through that information. Um, yes. And a lot of times people don't remember all of that information. That it comes so rapidly. And information is also extracted from humans very rapidly as well. It, do, do you think, do you think they, um, uh, cause I've been shown a lot of information and I've reacted to it emotionally. And do you think that's something that they do? Do you think that's a process that, that might be underway? Like they're, um, uh, a, there's a lot of end of the world scenarios being shown. I've spoken to a few people who have said, Oh, you know, I, it, it's the end of the world. It, it, this, they showed me this thing and, you know, I, I didn't like it. And they were indifferent to my, whether I liked it or not. And there's an, there's an indifferent, like the, uh, the the small greys are indifferent. They have no emotion. They seem more robotic than the mid-sized taller greys. Yes, and I think that there are also several races of greys mm-hmm. visiting. There are slight variations in their appearance. Um, but it's interesting how you said that uh, the feeling of love. Mm-hmm. That one moment uh, you know that they are there to take you. And you are terrified. It's just unbelievable fear. Mm -hmm. But when you're with them and in that alien environment, uh, you are calm. There's a sense of familiarity. They let you know how much they love you. Yes. And some people think, well, that's artificial, that uh, they don't really mean that. They're just putting that onto you. And and, people will report that this feeling of love uh, is more intense than anything they've ever experienced on Earth. Uh-huh. Just as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, now, so, so that is very, very interesting. Now, the idea that there are uh, sort of a Noah's Ark uh, collecting DNA of everything on Earth uh, to reseed this planet if there is a cataclysmic event. Well, a lot of people have been given that information. I'm not sure that they're saying that this is definitely going to happen because there's a slight variation in the information that people are being given from what Mm -hmm. I can see. Uh, Some people are merely being told that they are concerned about the survival of our species over time. And if there were a cataclysmic event or a huge environmental disaster, they would have this material so that they could propagate the species. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not cut and dried. And there's, there's some that also uh, mentioned that they're just you know, overseers that, that just tend to us like farm animals or, I should, we shouldn't say farm animals, that, that, um, they're caretakers because of their longevity, um, compared to us. So we, on, on the show, Mecky and I, sadly Mecky isn't with us tonight, but, um, 
um, uh, we've described ourself just so that others can understand this to the mayfly. Mm-hmm. The mayfly lives for a very short time indeed. Uh, however, we can live, you know, 70, that's the average for males, I think, 75 years in comparison. And to them, to the mayfly, if they were conscious and we'd get to talk to them, they would think that was an extraordinary length of time. Well, the same things relative to the, the, the grey living several hundred years, um, 700, 500, whatever the, the description has been, um, so far. Uh, do you, is that something that's also come through with any of your research? Uh, they do appear to live for a very long period of time, and some people uh, have been given uh, the message that you know they are caretakers in a sense, they're overseers. Uh, they've also been given uh, messages that they uh, that is their purpose, and that they do not wish to interact directly with our civilization, Mm -hmm. that they don't want to interfere, uh, that they're more absorbed. Right, that that these orders come from a higher source, in fact. And um, have you been been described about maybe like a possible hierarchy that they're... um, We have councils that need triplicate for everything, uh, no one can act independently. They, it all has to come from above. It, I, I've heard very similar. Is that what you've what you've come across? Well, you know, there's there's so much that's written about this. Linda Howe, in her testimony mm-hmm. yesterday, stated that uh, from her information, there, um, and and this was from documents, government documents that she was given, that. Uh, there are, I can't know, it wasn't government talk, documents, it was testimony, I believe, mm-hmm. from uh, a deathbed testimony from a man who uh, was in the know. And she was told that there were several races of greys, that there was also a race of, of blonde, blue-eyed individuals who looked very similar to humans but were not, mm-hmm. and then there was a reptilian race coming at that time, and that none of them liked each other. But I've heard so many people are saying, well, the the blue-eyed blondes are at the top of the hierarchy and over the others. I've heard nothing but disagreement between the greys and the reptilian groups that they really don't like each other at all. <laughs> um, and then there is also a newer group, the insectoid group. Oh, yes. Who, is, has been taking many, many people uh, since the 1980s, as far as I can tell, mm-hmm. maybe earlier. I, I was fascinated with the praying mantis itself. Um, yes. And as a child, stared into those eyes as much as I could, um, because we used to have a lot of them down our side fence. Mm-hmm. That they, it doesn't matter what angle you hold the head at, but the eyes always appear to be looking at you. That's just their, comp- their complex eye. And um, it was Whitley Strieber's book um, and then subsequent movie, Communion, which the, in, his, in the, his rendition, it, it seemed to be one and the same. They're hiding themselves. That was his, uh, his rendition of it, they're, that they're, in fact possibly insectual, insectoid with masks, that was what he was putting forward, and just because he doesn't know. And yes, and some, and some people do um, describe them as appearing to, to be wearing masks. I don't know for sure where that comes from. Another very interesting case that involves these insectoids is the Thomas and Matthew Reed case. There's a lot of evidence in that case. And also Denise Stoner. Oh. In the Denise Stoner case, Mm -hmm. uh, she has been interacting with uh, these tall, thin insectoids who appear to have arthritic joints 
And, uh, and also they appear to be working in concert with the Greys. Wow. There's so much to take in. Um, yes. You know, it makes me wonder, is this another species of greys? What, you know, where do the, uh, insectoids fit in here if they are in fact working with these gray beings? Mm-hmm. Which yeah, is being reported over and over and over again to me. I, I, I've heard, uh, in Travis Walton's case, he, um, he tried to fight. He tried to say no. I don't yes. want this successfully or not successfully, depending on what, how you look at it. Uh, he was already captive. Um, uh, in the rooms, there's reported to be um, pe- uh, greys ready so that you're not going to steal anything or take anything with you. No mementos. Um, you don't get to keep the shower cap. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, and there's ones that are to calm you and keep you in place. But how does I, – I, I would love one day just to be able to – I wish, and, and I, I wish this on myself only, that, um, that a fully conscious uh, visit and tour of the establishment and maybe a cup of tea – <laughs> would be a lovely experience rather than the one that you get. Yes. Um, I'd like to be given more information, and the more information I get, probably the less I'll talk about it. <laughs> because we don't we don't talk about oh you know I, when I put the key in my car today it was it, you know it just felt awesome. We don't mm-hmm. do that day to day things we don't do it. So um, I was going to ask you, um, is there much difference in the their craft themselves, and um, if if I had to describe a UFO, um, it's not going to be a biplane or a jet plane or a propeller-driven plane. It's going to be a craft of unusual flight characteristics. It's normally a silent experience. They could glow, not glow, have windows, no windows. Um, you know, instantaneous acceleration. Uh, or apparent acceleration, uh, and there's no wings or means of, you know, visible propulsion systems or anything that we recognize. Yes. So we have to imagine, our brains have to imagine that it's in fact, you know, an anti-gravitic, uh, gravitic uh, propulsion system of some kind. Uh, I'm like Electromagnetic as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there is there much difference in the description of the crafts themselves when they're, when they're visible or in your reports or any of your research? There are a variety of different models. Mm-hmm. Um, there are the small teardrop shaped. I don't hear about those as often anymore. They were reported a lot earlier on. Uh, of course, the disc shape, mm-hmm. which ranges in size from about 35 feet to about 80 feet. Wow. And then, of course, there are the very large, and and generally these very large ones are reported as either cigar-shaped or uh, as reported as being triangular in shape and with with rounded corners. Mm-hmm. And like the TR3B. <laughs> yes, but only but. But gigantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and many experiencers are taken at a time on these larger craft. This is where the laboratories are. Mm-hmm. This is where there are huge amounts of extraterrestrial beings. Uh, you'll see lots and lots of greys on board these craft. In fact, two of the experiencers that I wrote about in the book describe being on that craft going through the same experience and perhaps seeing each other on the craft. Oh, I just got chills. Um, I met someone once who we don't live in the same place. We've never been shopping in the same place. We've worked in different cities, and yet we knew each other. And we knew each other well, but we'd never spoken. Yes. 
it was finally, after a long time, um, of trying to work this. I don't mean in minutes. I mean in weeks. Um, we were racking ourselves over it. And then we finally came to the realization that you were the other person with me there. And I said, where? And I said, well, they, oh, you know, yeah, okay, yes, I remember now. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that was, that was, uh, you know, a while ago. Yes, it was. And, um, we, we didn't want to say the actual words out loud, but we recognized each other. And it was an extraordinary thing. Is that, is that also common? Is, sorry, it, it obviously it happens. Cause it, it, it happens. It occurs sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I only had a small percentage of the experiencers that have contacted and spoken with me uh, have, have stated that that had occurred. Mm-hmm. Wow. This interview is mind-blowing, and I hope everyone listening to this is getting the same experience because, um, you know, it's not just a personal journey for me, but I hope, I hope I'm able to, um, to bring out a lot of information for everyone. And we're, we're getting right to the end of the show. Um, uh, it's been an absolute wonderful experience to have you on the show, Kathleen. It's been my pleasure to be on with you. Uh, I, I really appreciate your asking me to to uh, give this information to you. You know, and I'm going to uh, pop into the show notes, which will be available for forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Kathleen-Marden.com links. Um, uh, also, uh, the uh, Amazon, or we'll talk after the show, Kathleen, and and I'll get the links for all of your books. That'll all be in the show notes as well. Okay. As well as that. Um, I I have to thank you so much for this experience. And if only I lived in the U.S., I would would honestly um, want you to um, – I'd I'd volunteer myself and, and my life's history to you if you ever need it. For any of your work, if you ever do that, uh, if, if I become wealthy enough to travel, um, and maybe one day we could, uh, uh, hook up and I could be one of your subjects. Well, I would hope that someday we can meet because you've had some many, many very interesting experiences and they certainly sound 100% real based upon all the information that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. And I, I would like to um, I'd like to thank you so much, and um, I look forward to if you ever need um, a platform to discuss anything, uh, you're welcome back on the show anytime you want. Thank you so much. Appreciate that's it. No problem. Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you next week for another shiny side out with Dave and No Mackie. Uh, He'll be back next week. Thanks, guys.